Hello and welcome to the Studio Canal Presents podcast. My name is Simon Brew from Film Stories magazine and this is a brand new monthly podcast exploring one of the biggest and deepest film libraries in the world. Studio Canal's catalogue of films, and I've sent the whole list, brings together cinema from across the globe, going back over a century, from Paddington 2 and two Tom Hardys in Legend, to John Carpenter Classics, The French New Wave, Billy Liar, Peeping Tom, a whole lot of Ealing, no shortage of carry-ons. The full library is over 6,000 titles strong, and this podcast will be exploring it. Every episode, I'll be joined in the studio by a guest for a deep dive into our film choice of that month. And along the way, we'll flag up new releases and re-releases and hopefully add a movie or two to your watch list as well. Later in the series, we're going to be exploring some serious gems on this podcast, including Nicholas Rogue's 70s sci-fi, The Man Who Fell to Earth, the electrifying French coming-of-age drama, Girlhood, and the film that's been called the best British movie of all time, The Third Man. We're also going to be looking at upcoming theatrical releases as well, such as July's The Railway Children Return. But we're starting with what I think I can confidently call a modern classic of a movie. Saigon. Shit. I'm still only in Saigon. When I was here, I wanted to be there. When I was there... All I could think of was getting back into the jungle. That's a clip from Francis Ford Coppola's iconic Apocalypse Now, his 1979 wildly ambitious Vietnam War set drama that you can stream now in the UK on the Studio Canal Presents channel on the Apple TV app. Just a bit of background on the channel itself. Its catalogue of titles grows each month with new and exclusive material. Studio Canal Presents is a destination for anyone who loves great films and series, and Apocalypse Now very much is one of those. I'd like then to introduce my guest for this episode, Ellen E. Jones. Ellen is a writer and broadcaster specialising in film and television. She's the co-host of Screenshot on BBC Radio 4 and currently working on a book for Faber about anti-racism on screen. And also, Ellen, you once got chatted up by Kermit the Frog. That's right. He couldn't help himself. Miss Piggy, I'm sorry, but that's what he's like. You need to know. (laughs) (laughs) Well, if we can move from Kermit the Frog to Colonel Kurtz and turn our attention to Apocalypse Now. How would you introduce the film to someone who's not seen it or perhaps even heard of it before? So Apocalypse Now is a psychedelic war movie for a psychedelic war. It's the first great and perhaps only great Vietnam War movie. It was directed by Francis Ford Coppola in 1979, loosely based on the 1899 novel by Joseph Conrad, Heart of Darkness. But whereas that book was set in the late 19th century Congo, here the action's been transposed to the Vietnam War in the 70s, early 70s, late 60s. I was going to the worst place in the world and I didn't even know it yet. Weeks away and hundreds of miles up a river that snaked through the war like a main circuit cable, plugged straight into Kurtz. Martin Sheen stars as a kind of undercover operative who's been sent deep into the jungle, down the river on a riverboat, in search of this sort of mystic figure, Colonel Kurtz, played by Brando, Marlon Brando, who has been sent mad by war and mad by the jungle and become one with the quote-unquote savages. It was no accident that I got to be the caretaker of Colonel Walter E. Kurtz's memory, any more than being back in Saigon was an accident. There is no way to tell his story without telling my own. And if his story is really a confession, then so is mine. You said there that you consider it the greatest of the Vietnam War movies. Mm. And what I find interesting with Apocalypse Now is they started working on it whilst the Vietnam War was still going. That was when the project was initiated. One of the interesting things about the production of this film is it's a collaboration between a lot of men who are a very specific generation. We sometimes refer to this as New Hollywood. But Francis Ford Coppola, the writer John Milius, it actually began as a collaboration between John Milius and George Lucas. John Milius graduated from film school at the same time as George Lucas and Steven Spielberg, so he's kind of part of this crew. 
all of these men of that, that generation, their fathers fought in the Second World War, but were known as that the great generation, the greatest generation. And I think there's a real sense of them living in the shadow of this generation who got to prove themselves in that war. So this is a war movie made by men who didn't go to war, but perhaps wanted to, and are therefore kind of recreating that experience. You mentioned too there the source novel by Joseph Conrad. And I mean, it's a very thin book, isn't it? Would mm. you say it's inspired by other novels as well as that one? How close do you think it also plays yeah. to Conrad's text? Well, one thing that should be said is Coppola was always quite dismissive, actually, in a way of, of John Milius' script. He said that he wasn't referring to the script constantly while he was on set. He was referring to a paperback penguin copy of Heart of Darkness, which he had in his back pocket the whole time. So for him, it really was where John Milius' script has kind of gone off into his own war fantasies. He wanted to bring it back to an adaptation of the book. But I do think that there's other stuff going on there as well. There's obviously the Odyssey. Coppola called it the Idi Odyssey, his Idi Odyssey, i.e. Odyssey of Idiots at one point. You know, in the sense that it's about this journey. Willard, Martin Sheen's character, is meeting all these kinds of people along the way who are distracting him from his purpose or changing his purpose. And then the other text that I think is really instrumental to Apocalypse Now is The Great Gatsby. The F. Scott Fitzgerald book from the 20s. Yeah. Part of the reason I say that is Coppola himself had just finished, well, the production of Apocalypse Now goes on for so long that it's kind of hard to pinpoint what Coppola was doing at any particular time. But he'd uh, written the script for the 1974 film The Great Gatsby. So that was obviously in his mind when he was working and had begun working on Apocalypse Now. The Great Gatsby is this story of Gatsby himself, but it's told through the eyes of another party, Nick. And the relationship between these two characters, this sort of mirage of a man who's Gatsby, which you might think of as Colonel Kurtz and this guy who's kind of on his trail trying to track him down fascinated by him intimidated by him but also kind of wanting to unmask him and how this man represents America and all that kind of stuff that's all in Apocalypse Now as well and I think a lot of that comes from Gatsby I knew the risks or imagined I knew but the thing I felt the most much stronger than fear was the desire to confront him. This was a key era for Francis Ford Coppola, perhaps the key part of his career Mm -hmm. that you mentioned about how it's hard to pinpoint what he was doing at any given time. Mm. And this being the period where he was making The Godfather, The Conversation, what a film The Conversation is, The Godfather Part 2. He was really the only person who get a project like this off the ground. He had the clout of his Oscars at that point. One of the things I find fascinating, and I've got this slightly snarky thing to say about Apocalypse Now, which I'll get out of the way, which is that I kind of think it's the last great film that Francis Ford Coppola made. Oh, um, controversial. <laughs> it's partly because I just, I'm just awestruck by the awesomeness of Apocalypse Now. And I really have a lot of admiration for Coppola as an artist who was very self-aware of his artistry and really knew the best conditions that he worked under and really knew his powers and wanted to push those powers you know, so that they could fulfil their potential, which was immense. So I think this is the point of his career. He's very well aware that he's just come off the back of Godfather, Godfather Part Two, Conversation, all of them winning multiple Oscars, really epitomising the highest form of the cinema art in that they're both commercially successful, totally entertaining, but are also smuggling in these really big, interesting ideas. They're both art and entertainment. I mean, that's why, for me, Coppola is the best of that generation of directors, because he really nails that. So he knows that he's got a lot of kudos in the bank, and this is him deciding to cash it in. I use that financial metaphor not that lightly, because he also pledged a lot of his own wealth and money that he'd accumulated from the Godfather films on Apocalypse Now. And as the production kind of ran and overran, he was putting more things up as collateral, his beautiful vineyard ranch in Northern California, all the sort of trappings of this Hollywood director lifestyle. He put them all on the line for the realisation of his artistic vision. Notwithstanding your passive-aggressive dig there at the Robin (laughs) Williams headlined Comedy Jack that Coppola also (laughs) directed, which I I now am taking, you don't think is superior to Apocalypse Now. One of the things I'm fascinated, you mentioned the funding of Apocalypse Now. Yeah. I mean, Coppola frequently had to bail this out, but this also at heart was an independent film, wasn't it? Yeah, what an independent film. I mean, when the project began and George Lucas was slated to direct, it was with Warner Brothers. And they had this perhaps even crazier idea that they were going to shoot in Vietnam while the war was going on. When that, with very good reason, fell through, Warner Brothers, I think, lost interest and they really couldn't get it made by any of the major studios. I think partly that's because the topic of the war was so touchy 
it wasn't the time, you know, studios are notoriously not particularly brave when it comes to challenging the social consensus of the time. So they weren't really up for that. So it, if it was going to get made, it kind of had to be independently. And Coppola at the same time had just sort of started up this Zoetrope production company. And he was looking for a project to kind of launch it. And this became that project. He kind of got interested in, in Milius' script and, and, and went off he went. We've touched once or twice on Colonel Kurtz, played by Marlon Brando yeah. in the film, but the legend of Apocalypse Now seems very much tied to Marlon Brando as well. Can you mm-hmm. talk a little bit about that for us and about his involvement? I think um, it's a bit of a case of be careful what you wish for <laughs> from Coppola's part because he, he had, from the start, he'd wanted this to be not just an adaptation of a book or from Millius' screenplay, but he'd wanted to really infuse the project with him and his crew and his cast's own experiences out in the Philippines, out in the jungle, recreating what it would be like to be a Vietnam soldier on this kind of odyssey. And that became a little bit too true when he cast Brando. He obviously had worked with Brando before, but Brando's still Brando, and he demanded a million a week for his work on set, so totaling three million. He'd kind of promised to like get in shape for the role, but then turned up very overweight and underprepared. He'd also promised to read Heart of Darkness, but evidently hadn't done. <laughs> if only someone had a copy of that on set, they could have lent him. Unbelievable. Yeah. Um, he insisted that his character be renamed. He kept asking about the motivation of the character and you know all these annoying things that um, these great actors do. I think it kind of challenged Coppola to really, again, do what he had set out to do and sort of work that and that experience into the film itself. And the way that he uses the cinematography, he uses shadow to kind of obscure, I suppose, Brando's frame, but also to just gradually reveal him ends up working really well. Are my methods unsound? I don't see any method at all. We talked a little bit earlier about this being the first real Vietnam War movie, the the best Vietnam War movie. But do you think Vietnam War films differ from other kind of war films particularly? Yeah, absolutely. I think the most fundamental, crucial thing is that Vietnam War movies become interested in what happens to the psychology and the psyche of the American man after he has been fighting in a war, like the ways in which men are traumatised, how they bring that home with them and how it affects their lives. So before Apocalypse Now came out, you had The Deer Hunter, the preceding year, The Deer Hunter and the Hal Ashby film called Coming Home, both of which are Vietnam War movies but spend much more time back in America looking at how life was before the war for these men who fought and how it is after the war and and how they kind of are struggling to readjust into society. So I think Apocalypse Now... It's taking that interest in the psyche and the damaged psyche of the soldier, but putting us really immersively into the experience of war. So we're on this odyssey with Willard and the rest of the boat crew. Inside his head, the narration puts us inside his head. Narration, incidentally, was not written by John Milius or Coppola. It was written by another guy, Michael Herr. He had been in Vietnam in the late 60s as an embedded reporter for Esquire magazine. So... Yeah, Apocalypse Now is investigating the psyche. But in in doing so, like this is kind of one of the problems I have with the films or one of the fascinations I have with it. It turns war into like a tragedy for the individual and specifically a tragedy for the individual American soldier. And in doing that, it's kind of ignoring the wider context of why America is in this war in the first place, just the sort of evils of colonialism generally. and It's making it all about just these poor guys. One of the ways I look at it is like, of course, if you are going to be participating in the massacre of a village of civilians, that's going to have a detrimental effect on your psychology. (laughs) I'd hope (laughs) so. Yeah. yeah. But is that really where our sympathies should be focused in that situation? You get that attitude a lot also from Kilgore, Robert Duval's character. There's this incredible scene, the Ride of the Valkyries scene, where um, they're riding into this village on helicopters about to drop bombs on them or just shooting at the village soon to drop loads of napalm on them. I think it's one of the most key scenes in the film. But after kind of wreaking this horrendous violence, the very next scene, Kilgore witnesses a Vietnamese woman dropping a um, grenade into a helicopter and he's like, oh, these savages. (laughs) <laughs> and there's this wonderful irony in there with the, the film is very much picking up on though the characters are not which is that it's okay to do incredible violence if you're playing a bit of Wagner while you're doing it that's civilised but if you're 
doing violence and you're not playing Wagner, then you're a savage. You smell that? Hey, fun, son. Nothing else in the world smells like that. There are stories of troubled film productions which don't even deserve to be in the same book uh, of the list of <laughs> troubled film productions compared to Apocalypse Now. There's Martin Sheen's heart attack yeah. the, and having to hide that in yeah. case the film got shut down. There's helicopters Amazing. being taken away. Yeah. Typhoons destroying a Playboy yeah. set. Yeah. Um, I mean, <laughs> it was more than just the Playboy set. Yeah, well, quite. Was, yeah. Like, almost all of the set was just destroyed by this amazing typhoon. Yeah. Just so much went wrong. Everything that could go wrong did go wrong, it sounds like. Is it one of those you think where that's ultimately been to the benefit of the film? Mm. I wonder what Coppola would say about that. I'm sure he's been asked. I think he got what he asked for in that, you know, be careful what you wish for kind of way, in that he had this kind of extremely intense experience. So I think that the key quote that came from Coppola after he'd spent all this time making this movie, he finally got it in front of an audience at Cannes and it had been screened to rapturous applause. At the press conference afterwards, he said, My film is not about Vietnam, it, it is, is Vietnam. Vietnam. It's what it was really like. It was crazy. And the way we made it was very much like the way the Americans were in Vietnam. We were in the jungle. There were too many of us. We had access to too many, uh, too much money. Too much equipment. And little by little we went insane. Whether or not he would have asked for it, in true Coppola style, he turned it to his advantage in marketing the film and making sure people went to see it and were entertained by it. Have you ever been to one of those press junkets for a war film and sat through an actor cell where we had to do a week of boot camp and it was really, really, really difficult? Yes. Do you think we should invite Coppola along to be the journalist at that junket <laughs> next time? Well, that's the other thing. This kind of trouble production at least spared him the boot camp thing because I think Apocalypse Now is one of the few, at least sort of post that Vietnam War era movies where they didn't do the whole put the actors <laughs> into six weeks of boot camp. There's an old cliche that you could make a film about the making of some films and in the case of apocalypse now that happened that Ellen Coppola released many many years later Hearts of Darkness a filmmaker's apocalypse that for me was a real turning point in that I had never seen the making of a film Mm. laid so particularly bare Francis is in a place within himself a place he never intended to reach a place of conflict and he can't go back down the river because the journey has changed him I was watching from the point of view of the observer not realizing I was on the journey too. Now I can't go back to the way it was. Neither can Francis, neither can Willard. So when Coppola finally went out to the Philippines to start shooting, he took his family with him, which was Eleanor Coppola, his wife, and his three kids. So we get to see a very cute Sophia Coppola in the movie. Whatever happened to him? (laughs) Never heard from since. No, no. And she was kind of recording footage behind the scenes of the production. And she was also secretly recording conversations with her husband talking about work, you know, when he got home from work and that sort of thing. And um, one of the things I love about the film, you get from Heart of Darkness a real sense of the kind of artist that Coppola is, which is self-aware, aware of his potentials and his limitations. He knows who he is and what the kind of artist is, and I think that's essential to him being able to pull off something on this grand epic scale. There's little, You get to see him kind of talking with Dennis Hopper and like just really good like people skills just managing these kind of wild actors who are all on loads of drugs all the time you see in the film the actors talking about which specific drugs they were taking in which which specific scene which I find interesting as well Did you drop any acid during during film? Sure To Dolong Bridge? No I was I I did something else at Dolong Bridge I uh, I was doing speed then and marijuana and alcohol I mean we were bad we were just bad boys you know You touched on the narration, and one of the Mm. things about the narration of the film is, I mean, it's pretty much redone completely Mm. in post-production. And the whole post-production of this movie fascinates me. It was edited, of course, by Walter Murch. And Walter Murch wrote a book, In the Blink of an Eye, where he laid bare just what he had to work with in pulling this film together. I'm just going to quote some of his stats at you. They shot one and a quarter million feet of film, which equates (laughs) to 230 hours of footage. And Murch 
Welsh breaks it down in the book and he describes it at a 95 to 1 ratio. And so the movie nerd in me is thinking, I, I've seen lots of films, I've never seen it in that ratio. And then he explains that for every 95 minutes of film shot, one minute made it Just to the screen. They made a film so for, for every wait, minute. You need to say that again. Every for, 95 minutes shot, only one minute one made minute to the screen. One minute made to the film. Now, the average ratio for a film, he argues, is 20 to 1. And this was in the pre-digital era. Yeah. Um, I mean, I was looking around at other films that had shot like over a million feet of film because this is incredibly rare. There's some unusual ones you wouldn't expect. There's mm. the Adam McKay comedy Step Brothers did. Baz <laughs> Luhrmann's Australia shot more than two million feet of it. But for Merch, he was in the editing room with just the footage for a year and then another year with the sound because all the sound effects were recorded in mono or weren't particularly good quality on set and they had to I don't know how much they paid them. him, but I do know that he earned every penny. But we, we talk sometimes about um, films being fashioned in the editing room. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure I'd necessarily say Apocalypse Now was fully fashioned in the editing mm. room, but clearly it's had a, a huge impact on the final movie. What is the final movie, though? That's your Well, I, it's odd you should say that. Oh, you're good at these segues. Because even when it premiered at Cannes, yeah. that was a different cut to the one that appears several months later in cinemas. There's a, a rumoured longer cut that's gone around on television. There's the Redux edition at the start of the 2000s. There's the mm-hmm. final cut, which, as I understand it, is Coppola's preferred mm-hmm. in 2019. So I'm glad you asked which is the version of the movie. Yeah. Because... So Which many. is the version it of the movie, of exists, Ellen? Sort I, it out for us. <laughs> I think it exists in this sort of platonic, unfinished state forever, and that's part of its longevity, is that you're never quite sure if Coppola's going to slip out another final, 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 this is definitely the final cut. What would he call cut. it? He's at the final <laughs> cut. Just uh, kidding. Final cut redux? Yeah, uh, just it, kidding. Oh, no, that's, no, that's better. Just kidding. This is the final cut. <laughs> Coppola, it's also worth noting, has form now on going back to his films. When we talk about if there's a final cut of Apocalypse Now, mm. there's the same question about is there a final cut of The Outsiders? That mm. that recently came back round with a new version. The Cotton Club he's tinkered with. The Godfather Part 3 is now not called that because there's another version of that. He's not done The Rainmaker yet. I mean, it's crying out for it, isn't it? <laughs> um, I mean, my mum's a portrait painter. She paints portraits and she tinkers as well. But she says there's a sort of magic point where you go too far and then you've ruined it. Part of being an artist is to know when something's finished. And I guess when you're an artist who's working in a space as commercial as the film and TV industry, there's always going to be other pressures on you to finish before you feel like you're quite finished. But in that dance is where like the greatness of cinema is. So I think he should have just, he should know when to just leave it. So the final, final, final cut coming soon. <laughs> now, Ellen, I, I did ask you to have a bit of a dive into the Studio Canal collection of films for a hidden gem that might tie into Apocalypse Now. You found a really interesting choice. Can you tell us about that? Yes, so there's this 1934 film called Java Head, which I came across because I was researching what was the first ever interracial kiss on film or TV. And a lot of people think it's um, Lieutenant Uhura and Captain yeah. Kirk and um, Star Trek, but it absolutely isn't. It's complicated to pin it down for lots of reasons, but that's a whole other podcast. But one of the main contenders is this film Java Head, which stars Anna Mae Wong, who's this Chinese-American movie star playing a Chinese woman in, I think it's 1830s, but Victorian Bristol anyway. This is Tao Yuan, my wife, my father. I am humble before this honour. It sort of reminds me of Apocalypse Now in reverse in a funny way because the plot of this film is that a British merchant sailor comes back to his family and he brings with him his Chinese bride, played by Anna Mae Wong, And she's like this very, as you'd expect from a film made in 1930s England, this very stereotypical kind of dragon lady Chinese woman. All the beauty and culture of 2,000 years of civilization flowered in one woman. It's all about the opposition between East and West. There's this idea that his family are obviously totally horrified that he's done this, that he's got this interracial marriage. What did you say her name was? Tao Yuan, it means peach garden. Tao Yuan Amidon. Oh, it doesn't sound right, my boy. The two won't go together. And the film then kind of confirms their horror and their prejudices by, in the end, he goes back to being with his one true love, who's like the English rose girl next door. And um, Anna Mae Wong's character goes insane and then commits suicide so that the 
happy English couple can be together. But it has this kind of journey from one culture, from a sort of an East Asian culture into a Western culture, and then someone going slowly mad as well. So it does sort of remind me of an apocalypse now in reverse, although, again, obviously very much from the from the white man's perspective. And remind us of the name of the film again? It's called Java Head, 1934 film set in Bristol. If you if you're, live in Bristol, it's particularly fascinating <laughs> because as you can see all the different parts of the city. And Java Head is available on DVD. Someday this war is going to end. So a reminder, if you haven't seen it or if hearing all of that has made you want to watch it again, then you can stream Apocalypse Now, which I should note is the inspiration for the best joke in the comedy film Hot Shots Part Deux, on the Studio Canal Presents channel on Apple TV right now, where you'll find a plethora of other great films as well, everything from Breathless to Basic Instinct. Now, before you head off, Ellen, I I just wonder if you could help us with a regular feature of the show where we ask our guest, which is you, to help me dive even deeper into the Studio Canal Library by suggesting a dream double bill from the thousands of films within it. So can you tell us what you've picked for us? I'm really pleased with myself about this. You've got such a... Audio doesn't get this across, but if I could like tr- even begin to find the words to describe the grin on your face. Go on, hit, hit us with it. Um, I actually just can't wait to get home and watch it, but it's Attack the Block from 2011. What is that, guys? That's an alien, bruv, believe it. And I landed in the wrong place, though. You get <laughs> the wrong place. And Passport to Pimlico from 1949. A British passport for Pimlico. Customs and a frontier post in Pimlico. There must be some mistake. Oh, that's a double bill everybody yes. comes up with, isn't it? Those, those two <laughs> always get paired together. That That is an unusual pairing. So why have you paired those two? I think it makes total sense because they're both films about cities within a city or communities within a community. They're about the resilience of a community to outside attack. And they also... For someone who spends a lot of time kind of railing against the evils of colonialism and nationalism, they're films that make me feel weirdly proud to be British as well. I'm killing them. I'm killing them in the street. Let's get torn up, blood. Quite sweet, really, aren't they? Eleni Jones, thank you so much for joining us. And can you just give us the exclusive on when, when your next Kermit date is? Well, if I tell you, then Miss Piggy's going to know and then it's all You gone are up absolutely so We keep no, it on the deal You are Kermit. no fun, no fun. <laughs> Thank you again for coming along. <laughs> now let's turn to the regular section of the show where we flag up one or two upcoming releases to put on your radar. And I'm going to start this month with the 4K UHD Blu-ray release of the 1985 horror film Cat's Eye. Stephen King, your favourite novelist and master of modern horror, has written his first motion picture screenplay. It combines all the elements of his creative imagination. Now, I wanted to talk about this in particular, not least because it's coming out, but also, firstly, it's something of a hidden gem Stephen King movie adaptation, in this case from director Lewis Teague, who's got a bit of form there. And I've got a personal vested interest in Cat's Eye, given that it's one of the three films that's most terrified me in my life. Cat's Eye is actually three stories in one, joined cunningly by a cat. And it's an anthology of which I draw specific attention to chapters one and three in the movie. The first, I'm getting very spoiler light, is called Quitters Inc. And it's the story of a man who's trying to quit smoking. And without giving anything away, I'd suggest there's a dotted line from this particular chapter of the film to David Fincher's 1997 thriller, underrated thriller as well, The Game. Watch closely, Mr. Morrison. Nothing up by the sleeve. And you will notice, at no time does my hand leave my wrist. But the chapter that genuinely traumatised me here is the final tale in the movie, General. And this is where the cat that links the stories together ends up in the house of a young girl, played here by Drew Barrymore. Now, the problem is that said young girl is being terrorised by a creature at night and genuinely just talking about this makes me want to switch off all the lights and live in the middle of a room with a big torch strapped to my head in the hope of getting a bit of sleep. Now, my own personal first meeting with Cat's Eye, as with many, was on television. It was a VHS recording. Remember VHS? Back in the 1990s, I first saw it. 
it. And I'm genuinely fascinated to see whether the older, braver, more mature, more grown up me will be able to cope with it now it's been remastered in 4K. I'll be finding out on 23rd of May. If you don't hear from me on the 24th of May, you'll know something's gone wrong. Also very much in the field of my personal interest, looking slightly further ahead, Studio Canal is bringing Doctor Who back to cinemas, specifically the two made-for-cinema films starring Peter Cushing, and they're also coming onto 4K UHD Blu-ray disc as well. Allow me to introduce myself. I am Doctor Who, and this is my time and space machine. TARDIS. On June the 20th, Studio Canal is releasing its remaster of the Peter Cushing headline Doctor Who and the Daleks as a 4K UHD collector's edition and on digital platforms as well. And following that, Daleks Invasion Earth 2150 AD is released on July the 18th. As an added bonus, if you want to see both of them on the big screen as well, double bill screenings are taking place in UK cinemas from July the 10th, 2022. And we'll be talking a lot more about Doctor Who in our next episode. A couple of titles, too, on the vintage classics line to keep an eye out for. Innocence in Paris, starring Margaret Rutherford and Alistair Sim, and Peter Sellers in The Wrong Arm of the Law, and both of those titles are out now. And just to put one more date in your diary, The Railway Children Return is heading into cinemas on July the 15th, and again, we're going to be looking at that in a future episode as well. Do you remember our life in here? And that is it for the very first episode of the Studio Canal Presents podcast. We'll be back next month when critic and broadcaster Anna Bogatskaya and I will be delving into the world of Orson Welles with the classic The Third Man. In the meantime, to find out more about Studio Canal Films and the Apple TV channel, you can visit www.studiocanal.co.uk or follow at Studio Canal UK on Twitter and Instagram. And if you're young, you can also find Studio Canal on TikTok as well. The same address, at Studio Canal UK. I'm old. I've got no idea what TikTok is. I'm going to go and find out. I'll be back next month with the next episode of the Studio Canal Presents podcast.